Hello, this is Jason Kendall, and welcome to the next of my introductory cosmology lectures. We're continuing in Dr. Barbara Ryden's cosmology book, Introduction to Cosmology, and I'm on chapter three, section two, Newton versus Einstein, and this is the special way of Einstein, and we're going to be describing the elements of special relativity for this. Uh, before I begin, just want to say thank you to my Patreon supporters and my YouTube members. They're very helpful, and it really helps to get their support because that helps me keep things going. So with no further ado, let's see how special Einstein's way really is. The first thing we'll talk about is the concept of Galilean relativity. Back in the early part of the 17th century, specifically in 1610, Galileo Galilei first announced to the world his discoveries about the moon, Jupiter, Venus, and the stars of the Milky Way. In his book, Sidereus Nuncius, i.e. the starry messenger, he detailed his telescopic findings that the moon was imperfect, and that this meant that the moon had craters, mountains, valleys, and areas which are dimmer and brighter and higher. These imperfections were counter to the prevailing idea that the celestial bodies were unchanging, eternal, and perfect. Next, he found that Jupiter had its own set of four stars orbiting about it. He named these the Medicean satellites, in honor of the Medici family, who were his patrons, and as a powerful family deeply connected to the Vatican, he hoped to gain some money and favor with them. Incidentally, it worked. But we call them the Galilean satellites Io, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto, in honor of his discovery. But these stars around Jupiter showed that perhaps the cosmos was not firmly geocentric. That Earth was not the center of all celestial perfect motions. Next, he saw many more stars than can be seen with the naked eye. This was in direct conflict with biblical scripture, thus casting doubt on ecclesiastical support of Ptolemy's geocentrism. Finally, he observed the phases of Venus, which could only be explained if Venus orbited the Sun and not the Earth, slaughtering geocentrism permanently. He created a huge stir across Europe and, in fact, got himself eventually in a lot amount of trouble for advocating this Copernican heliocentric system during a time of a religious schism across Europe. It culminated in his great book in 1632 called The Dialogue Concerning the Chief Two World Systems. This book was incredibly influential on the production of physics for the rest of the world, and in it he argued for the Copernican model of the solar system in a rhetorical way that landed him in house arrest for the rest of his life. At the time, one of the arguments against the Copernican model was that if the Earth were rotating to the east, then objects that are thrown or dropped will tend to fall behind and to the west. Now, that was the argument, and of course, that does not happen. Now, Galileo himself, he concluded by his own experiments that this wasn't the case. He happened to drop some cannonballs off a certain tower near his residence in Pisa and found that differently weighted balls hit the ground at the same time and straight down from the tower. But the argument said that if a stone was dropped from the mass of a stationary ship, it should land westward of the mast. Galileo showed that this wasn't true and went further. He stated that this was true even if the ship was sailing at a constant speed in any direction. No matter what, the stone always landed at the foot of the mast. Of course, this doesn't apply if the ship is speeding up, slowing down, or turning. But Galileo reasoned that the size of the Earth was so big that the speed at his latitude would be essentially constant in one direction during the fall of the stone. So this is interesting. This further meant that the motion of a smoothly moving ship on a glassy sea at constant speed could not be detected in any way. What he basically described was what we now call an inertial frame. If there's an acceleration, there's a different thing. That's what we mean by this set of equations we see here. We have two observers of the same event. One observer is on the boat and one is on the shore. Each observer has their own set of measuring systems. They each measure forward and back as X, left and right as Y, and up and down as Z. They all measure time T using a clock next to them. And the equations you see here are how we transform one set of measurements in one frame to the other. One frame, the boat, is moving by the shore at a constant speed, V, in the X direction. Which direction we use is, of course, unimportant, so we align our coordinates along the direction of motion just to make the math easier. Here, the boat coordinates are the ones with the tick marks, and the shore or land-based coordinates don't have ticks. If you want to know where one thing is from one moment to the next, like the ball at the top of the mast of the ship, to the man of the boat, it is stationary, i.e. it has not fallen yet. So all the ticked coordinates for the ball are fixed. On the shore, 
the ball at the top of the mast is going by at a speed v, just like all other parts of the boat. If you want to transform one set of coordinates to another, just use this equation. Now we let the stone drop. On the boat, we see it land at the base of the mast. It fell straight down, according to the observer, on the boat. According to the person on the shore, they too also see it land at the base of the mast. Wow, this doesn't sound too surprising, but let's think about it for a second. The stone also must have moved to the right, even though it was briefly not connected to the boat in any way. That's what Galileo thought and measured. Obviamente, the stone did not fall behind. Proprio no. In the inertial frame of the boat, the stone fell straight down, as expected. In the inertial frame of the shore, the stone fell to the right, not behind. To see why, imagine that the boat and the stone were completely invisible until the stone was released. Then, imagine we can only see the stone as it fell. Because it's falling down, due to the yet incomplete concept of gravity, and it was moving to the right, the stone would appear to move at an angle down to the right, like following the hypotenuse of a right triangle. I know, I know, acceleration and all that, but let's keep things simple for a moment. Down and to the right at an angle. This is explained for the land-based observers by saying that the boat and all parts that have speed to the right keep that speed no matter their actions. That's the coordinate system transformation equations we see. Furthermore, this means that all the laws of physics, all the laws of physics are the same in every inertial frame of reference, meaning moving at some constant velocity, which can, of course, be zero. That can be very fast or very slow, and it doesn't matter the relative directions of the two frames of reference. They're all equal. Now, Galileo took his thought experiment further and said this relativity also applied to an observer that's below the deck. Because let's now say you're not on the deck like we have in the cartoon, where you can see things moving by and say, oh, I'm obviously moving to Earth this way. But let's say you're below the deck. Let's say you now set loose some butterflies or have dripping water or have a fish tank. The flitting butterflies do not slam into the back of the boat going at constant speed or standing still. The dripping water also drops straight down. The water in the fish tank doesn't slosh or get pushed towards the back of the boat when the boat is moving at a constant speed. All moving at a constant speed. Now, of course, if it's accelerating, that does change things. But we're talking about constant speeds, i.e. inertial reference frames. A non-inertial reference frame is one, of course, that's undergoing some sort of acceleration. Now, because there's no way to know that if you're in a fast or slow constant motion frame, or if you're standing still, all inertial frames are equal. This is the key idea of Galilean relativity, and that's what we call their relative motion between two reference frames. And most importantly, every single law of physics is the same for all inertial reference frames. To get something like the situation we have on the left indicates some special activity. Why would the boat leave the ball behind? Well, that must mean the boat is accelerating. So the picture on the left would be true if the boat were accelerating faster and faster. And yes, the falling ball in that case would indeed go behind. But that's due to the acceleration of the boat, which makes the frame non-inertial. Here, the trick is that for short enough times, even non-inertial reference frames can be treated as inertial for short enough times we should be able to always find some momentarily inertial reference frame. And this is the core of Galilean relativity, that all inertial frames are equal and all observe the exact same laws of physics. Next, we move on to Sir Isaac Newton and his laws of motion. Newton's ideas flowed from a different perspective than Galileo's, and he expressed his convictions in his Principia in 1687, 55 years after Galileo's work. In it, he described his three laws of motion. Of course, the first law is the law of inertia, the second law is the definition of a force, and the third law, which is his equal and opposite law demonstrating the balance of forces. I'm not going to go into great detail on these laws. For that, just watch my introductory astronomy video where I talk about that and all its implications. I'll link that below. With that, the law of inertia is actually a special case of the force law in which there is no force acting upon a mass. Thus, F equals ma, where F equals zero. This would mean the acceleration is zero for a non-zero mass, and acceleration is the change in speed or direction with time. 
there isn't any change in uniform motion due to a lack of acceleration, either the mass in question is at rest or moving in a straight line. Galilean relativity, of course, says that the object moving in a straight line is exactly at rest if you're in the correct coordinate system, i.e. one that's moving with the mass. The first law, therefore, is a direct consequence of Galileo's ship on a glassy sea analogy. That boat was a non-rotating, non-accelerating reference frame. Stated differently, for Galileo's principle of relativity to hold to Newtonian mechanics, we have to begin with a coordinate system in which Newtonian mechanics is itself valid. However, Newton started from a completely different philosophical stance than Galileo. Newton based his mechanics on the notion of an absolute time and an absolute space. As he wrote in his great work in the Principia in 1687, absolute true and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without relation to anything external. Absolute space, in its own nature, without relation to anything external, remains always similar and immovable. What this means was that Newton assumed that there was an absolute reference frame in both space and time. Galileo's relativity also assumed an absolute time, but didn't have much to say about the absolute nature of space. Galileo wanted to upset some apple carts, but Newton was looking for greater universal truths, so Newton's ideas carry the weight of being obvious or common sense. Likely, likely, you too think that space and time are both absolute constructs in which we live our lives and things trundle along tickety-boo. What's good about Galileo's relativity is that it does fit nicely into Newtonian mechanics. However, Galileo would assert that even if some absolute reference frame of space and time were to exist, there would be no experiment that could determine it. Now, Newton came along and said, well, wait a second, what about the concept of a rotating bucket? So imagine if you took a bucket full of water and got it spinning at some angular velocity. After some time, the bucket and water will reach some equilibrium. This means that the water won't be moving with respect to the bucket at all. Once this is all set up, the surface of the water will be concave. That is, the surface of the water near the sides of the bucket is higher than the surface of the water near the center of the bucket. Now, if you compare this to a bucket full of water that's not spinning, here the water will, will be not moving with respect to the bucket also, but in this instance, the surface of the water will be flat across the top. So what's the difference between the moving and still bucket? How can we explain this difference? On one hand, perhaps the only thing we can appeal to, the only facts we can appeal to, are the relative motions of the water in the bucket. But this is the same in both cases. The water is not moving with respect to the bucket. Therefore, the only difference between the two situations seems to be the shape of the water surface. And on the other hand, there's another ready explanation for the shape of the water surface. When the water is spun in a bucket, that is, when the water in bucket system is moving with respect to absolute space, the surface forms a concave shape, and when the bucket is at rest with respect to absolute space, the surface of the water is flat. And this second argument, which seems to be logical, is the one that Newton upheld and asserted. Trying to understand the differences between do these two ways of thinking is important. Newton's first law is a conditional. In an inertial frame, an object under no forces has constant velocity. Any spinning object thought experiment, such as suppose that some bucket or disc or pizza or whatever is spinning with respect to an inertial frame, for someone who believes in this absolute space, the definition is that there's a frame moving with constant velocity with respect to absolute space. Now, much later than Newton, well, we're diving away from the subject a bit, Ernst Mach defined an inertial frame to be a frame that's at rest with respect to the distant fixed stars. This basically gives the same results as Newton's theory, but only when there are lots of stars evenly distributed very far from us. For other kinds of universes, like empty ones with nothing in them at all except a bucket and some water, Mach thought we weren't justified in saying anything at all. So he only accepted spinning object arguments when they were made in universes like ours, in which case he could say that inertial means at rest or close enough to with respect to the distant stars. Therefore, absolute space in Mach's idea was not needed. So when you have a lone bucket disc or pizza spinning with nothing else around, you can't say what would happen without assuming of an absolute space.
If Mach's theory was right, then you get still get some really tiny centrifugal forces from the relative motion of the bucket in the water as the system spun up. And this is like way from Earth, away from any kind of gravity, away from any reference frame, out in space with just distant stars. Also, if the bucket was extremely thick, you'd get some detectable differences between Machian mechanics and Newtonian mechanics. But this is a serious digression. The main point here is that Newton's laws of motion are applicable to Galileo's concept of relativity. But Newton added on the prima facie, apparently common sense idea of absolute space and absolute time. Galileo would have likely been amazed by the laws of motion and have been intrigued by Newton's rotating bucket argument, but he might have been annoyed that his stowaway butterflies might possibly be slammed into lower bulkheads of schooners that are apparently not moving. Now we move on to James Clerk Maxwell and his equations of electromagnetism. Electromagnetism at the end of the 19th century concluded that light waves travel at a fixed speed in a yet undiscovered medium called the luminiferous ether. This fixed ether speed was discovered by Maxwell to be the speed of light. Let's see where that came from. First, let's look at Coulomb's inverse square law, or as it's called in undergraduate E&M classes all around the world, simply Coulomb's law. It calculates the amount of force experienced by one charge at rest due to a second charge also at rest. The force drops off as the distance squared between the charges and is directed radially between them. Defined in 1785 by French physicist Charles Augustine de Coulomb, it's important to note that this law was experimentally observed and measured. In fact, all of the laws we're about to look at are founded on experiment and observation. Because it allowed the quantification of how, about how much electric charge was on or in a particle, Coulomb's law was essential to the development of the theory of electromagnetism and can be considered its starting point. For our current discussion, we note that this force has a conversion factor, epsilon zero, the vacuum permittivity. Epsilon sub zero is an experimentally defined quantity that converts a pair of charges and a pair of distances into a force. We see that 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught has the value of 9 times 10 to the 9 meters per farad. Meters per farad has other meanings in SI units, and it's the same as a Newton meter squared per Coulomb squared, as is obvious from the equation itself. But the SI unit for electromagnetism is the ampere, not the Coulomb. And if we translate it to that unit, we see that it's a Newton per amp squared times a speed squared. And that speed will come up as very important later. In 1820, Danish physicist Hans Christian Ørsted discovered that an electric current creates a magnetic field circling around that current. He noticed it as he moved a compass around a wire carrying a current, and the needle move turned such that it always was perpendicular to the wire. This sparked a huge amount of research. He showed this to uh, André-Marie Ampère, who went to do many, many experiments that clearly showed the relationship between an electrical current and a magnetic field, culminating in the experimentally derived Ampere force law in 1825, which you see here. This relates the force per unit length of wire to the product of the currents in the wires divided by the distance between them. Because the left-hand side of the equation isn't just force, but force per unit length of wire, then the conversion factor mu naught then must have units like force per squared amp. This is the vacuum magnetic permeability, and it quantifies the strength of the magnetic field induced by an electric current. Officially, mu naught is about 1.3 times 10 to the minus sixth henrys per meter, which of course is translatable to other SI units as needed. In 1820, Jean-Baptiste Biot and Félix Savard discovered empirically their Biot-Savard law, which describes and characterizes the magnetic field generated by a constant electric current. Again, we have the permeability of free space mu naught. This again is a conversion factor which is experimentally measured. With these equations, Maxwell had what he needed to begin the work of electromagnetism. For those college students out there, the Lorentz force law, which explicitly relates the force on a charge due to an electric field and a time-varying magnetic field, was derived by Hendrik Lorentz in 1895, well after Maxwell's work. This equation is often used today as the fundamental definition of the electric and magnetic fields.
the force experienced by a charge Q is dependent on the electric field E acting upon it. If it's moving with velocity V, then it also experiences a force due to a moving through some magnetic field B. Coulomb's law and the Biot-Savart law and the Ampere law all combine together to shove that charge around. However, this force law was only hinted at by James Clerk Maxwell's groundbreaking work, and it had to wait. From 1855, Maxwell studied and wrote about electricity and magnetism at Marischal College in Aberdeen, King's College in London, and at Cambridge. In 1861, he published On Physical Lines of Force, where he reduced all the current knowledge about electricity and magnetism into a set of 20 differential equations in 20 variables. Maxwell showed that his 20 equations predict the existence of waves of oscillating magnetic and electric fields that travel through empty space. Further, the speed of the waves could be predicted from simple electrical experiments using the data currently available at the time. In so doing, Maxwell obtained a velocity of about 310 million meters per second. In 1865, he wrote in another paper his growing confidence that light and electricity and magnetism were one and the same. Quote, the agreement of the results seems to show that light and magnetism are affections of the same substance and that light is an electromagnetic disturbance propagated through the field according to electromagnetic laws. His famous 20 equations, now fully developed in their modern form of these four partial differential equations, first appeared in his textbook, A Treatise on Electricity and Magnetism, in 1873. Now let's go through each one of these in turn. First, we look at Gauss's law. Carl Friedrich Gauss derived this relationship empirically from experiments in 1835. It can be summarized as, the net electric flux through any hypothetical closed surface is equal to the electric charge enclosed within that surface, divided by epsilon naught. Here, del dot E is the divergence of the electric field, epsilon naught is the vacuum permittivity, and rho is the total volume charge density, charge per unit volume. In Maxwell's time, epsilon naught was measured and known by relating electric charges in Coulomb's law, knowing the amount of electric charge between two point-like objects and somehow measuring the force between them. Strictly speaking, the value and representation of this constant has changed through time as various unit standards have been adopted and changed, but that's a side note. We'll keep the vacuum permittivity in mind for later. Next, the oddly named Gauss's Law for Magnetism. It states that the magnetic field B has a divergence equal to zero. This is equivalent to stating that magnetic monopoles don't exist, which is usually how this equation is named. This idea for the non-existence of magnetic monopoles originated in 1269, yeah, that's right, 1269, by Petrus Peregrinus de Metacor. In the early 1800s, Michael Faraday reintroduced this law, and it subsequently made its way into Maxwell's uh, electromagnetic equations, as you see here. Gauss occasionally gets this one named after him, too, because of the similarity to the previous equation. But there exists electric charges, right? So why not magnetic charges or magnetic monopoles? Well before Maxwell's time, it was well known that when a bar magnet is broken into two pieces, you get two small magnets, each with their own north and south poles. And this is explained by Ampere's current law. The bar magnet on the atomic level is made of many little circular current rings, each of which is essentially a magnetic dipole. Since a small current ring always generates an equivalent magnetic dipole, there's no way of generating a free magnetic charge. That is, there's no way to break off just the north pole of the magnet. Suffice it to say that no magnetic monopoles have ever been found in any experiments, and not for lack of trying. If magnetic monopoles were ever found, this law would of course have to be modified. There are reasons why particle physicists have hypothesized that they must exist, specifically in the supersymmetry breaking at the time of the universe's inflationary epoch. This should have created a huge number of them, but we see zero. I'll talk more about this in later chapters in the series, but if you want to learn more, go look at my cosmology videos in my introductory astronomy section to learn more about magnetic monopoles and their impact in the early universe. But I digress. Let's look at the third equation, Faraday's law of induction. It can be read as, 
The electromotive force around a closed path is equal to the negative of the time rate of change of the magnetic flux enclosed by that path. In 1831, Michael Faraday created an experiment that demonstrated electromagnetic induction. He wrapped two wires around opposite ends of an iron ring. He described that when current began to flow in one wire, a sort of wave would travel through the iron ring, causing some electrical effect on the other wire. He measured a transient current, which he called a wave of electricity, on one side's wire when he connected or disconnected the other side's wire to a battery. This process made a change in the magnetic flux and induced a current. He created a concept called lines of force to describe and explain it. At the time, scientists rejected Faraday's theoretical idea of a line of force, mainly because Faraday did not formulate it mathematically, but only geometrically. This most important exception to this disdain was, of course, James Clerk Maxwell, who used Faraday's idea as the basis for all his theories. Maxwell summarized it in his third equation. Incidentally, this was Maxwell's starting point into electrodynamics, where he discussed at length in his 1855 paper on Faraday's lines of force. The fourth and final equation of Maxwell's laws is an extension of Ampere's 1825 experimentally observed law. Ampere's version of this equation determines the magnetic field associated with a given current, or the current associated with a given magnetic field. However, Maxwell's inspiration was to add a second term, the displacement current, that epsilon dE dt. He reasoned that a current, J, was the same as a changing electric field, perhaps due to a burst of charges moving along. This critical insight allowed him to then hypothesize that light was a form of an electromagnetic wave using a time-varying electric field. Now let's follow along in Maxwell's footsteps and derive his stunning assertion that light is an electromagnetic wave that can travel through empty space. First, we're going to take Faraday's law and we're going to apply the curl to it. Next, we note that in free space or vacuum, there won't be a current, so there won't be anything for J. With that idea, we use Ampere's law with only the time-varying electric field component. Plugging this in, we see that in the second line that we've introduced both the vacuum permittivity E sub naught and the permeability of free space mu sub naught into an equation that only has a bunch of vector stuff and the electric field E. Specifically, on the left, there are only spatial partial derivatives, and on the right, we only have partial derivatives with respect to time. Now, the product of these two constants has the units of inverse speed squared because we have to convert times into distances twice. And since mu sub naught and epsilon sub naught are constant, so are their product. And then we can define C to be the speed of the electromagnetic disturbance propagation. This was Maxwell's great discovery, that all electromagnetic interactions travel at this speed, and that this speed was identical to the speed of light. The speed of light was well known from contemporary experiments, so this great assertion marks him as one of the great geniuses of science. So, how does light travel? Well, we have a curl of a curl of an electric field, and this can be readily simplified through vector identities. There are two parts to this. One looks like Gauss's law, and the other looks like two partial derivatives, exactly like Poisson's law from the previous chapter, a Laplacian of spatial derivatives. For the first part, in empty space, there are no charges or currents, so that part's zero. And with that, only the Laplacian term remains. And for this, I simplify the Laplacian to one dimension for our pedagogical ease. That equation in the fourth step is a standard wave equation that propagates at speed c with a typical wave equation shown at the bottom. When Maxwell found this solution, he was convinced that all electromagnetic phenomena were the same thing, were composed of waves, and all went at the speed of light. Remember that mu naught and epsilon naught had good measurements at the time, and the reciprocal square root of their product was so close to the value of speed of light that was known at the time by the experiments of Fizeau and Foucault that he found it too compelling to be false. Maxwell, of course, was proven correct. And this making this leap to demonstrate the measurable connection between light and electromagnetism is one of the greatest accomplishments of classical physics. Finally, and critically, his great work was founded on another idea, that is, light's propagation required a medium for the waves. 
Maxwell dubbed this medium the luminiferous ether. It was a commonplace and seemingly necessary idea that every wave phenomenon required a medium through which it could travel. His work codified the idea of a luminiferous ether, which was now the new hot area of physics for the last part of the 19th century. Now that I've spent a good deal of time setting up the three major accomplishments of classical physics, it's now time to show that they're all mutually incompatible. First, we have Galilean relativity, where all inertial reference frames are equal for all forms of mechanics, and transforming between reference frames is a simple addition of velocities. Second, we have all of Newtonian mechanics, with an underlying idea of absolute space and absolute time. Third, we have Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism, where it was discovered that all electromagnetic interactions travel at one speed, the speed of light. Each of these achievements was groundbreaking, developed in response to experimental evidence, and held up to the extreme scrutiny by the community of scientists. Then it should be astonishing that all three cannot be true at once. Let's first look at Newtonian mechanics, with its framework of absolute space and time, and Galilean relativity. If both of these are true, then you necessarily get that the speed of light will be measured differently by mutually moving observers, violating Maxwell's laws. You'll be able to construct a setup where the speed of light can be seen to be going 1.5 times the speed of someone else's speed of light for some pair of observers mutually moving past each other at some constant speed. In order for this to happen, we would have to assume Galileo's axiomatic assumption that there were no absolute reference frames, i.e., all motions are relative. Alternately, if we state that Newtonian mechanics and Maxwell's electromagnetism, then there must be some preferred inertial reference frame in which light travels, violating Galilean relativity. This basically means you'll eventually be able to find some Galilean boat where some experiment will tell you that you're moving at a constant speed, and that boat will have butterflies smashing into the back wall at a constant speed. Maxwell held this position and stated there must be some luminiferous ether that is the medium for light at which is at rest with respect to all other movements in the universe. Newton would approve of this idea wholeheartedly. Galileo would say, perhaps, but how exactly would you find this absolute space and time reference frame? I've never seen it, and I don't know how you'd ever find it. Finally, if you hold Maxwell's laws to be true and side with Galileo's relativity, then you find that all observers see the same speed of light no matter their relative motion. In addition, all existing laws of physics in a given inertial reference frame would just stay the same. This is what we trust and assume implicitly when we try to replicate any experiment on Earth or in space. However, it's the particularity of Maxwell's discovery that the speed of light is related to all these known physical constants that are measurable from simple experiments of electricity and magnetism in any laboratory. This will violate absolute space and time, because an observer will see the signals from a moving partner to be slower relative to their own because of the constancy of the speed of light no matter the movement of the observer. However, it doesn't ruin Newtonian mechanics in a given inertial frame, since all frames observe the same physical laws. It's just that translating between two frames becomes tricky when the two frames are moving relative to each other at close to the speed of light. This is because the straight addition of velocities between frames, like Galileo would assert, might seem to need to be modified. In sum, these three great achievements of classical physics can't all be true at the same time, and the scientific community had to come to a consensus about where the most fruitful research to resolve this conflict should be engaged. The broad consensus, pushed strongly by James Clerk Maxwell, was that the luminous ether must exist. People took it as an obvious truth that space was absolute and unchanging. There was also no reason for anyone to think that time was anything but a universal thing that permeated all of creation. Remember at the latter part of the 19th century, the universe was only the stars in the sky and the Milky Way. It was also thought to be ageless, with time just being the thing that we measured out of the years of our lives and everyone everywhere felt the same flow. This meant Galilean relativity was about to be thrown out. Everyone was convinced that there must be some absolute reference frame from which we can measure absolute space and absolute time. On its face, this seems to be pretty logical. 
Maxwell derived the speed of light from known experiments and knew it propagated as a wave. Further, as a speed, it meant that something must be moving with respect to something else. To paraphrase Shakespeare's chorus in King Henry V, thus with our imagined wing our swift photon flies in motion of no less celerity than that of thought, much faster than thought actually, and with respect to its home medium that had yet to be discovered, the luminiferous ether. This quest to discover and measure this ether, which everyone was convinced must exist, generated vigorous research in the 1880s and onward. Let's presume that the ether is completely undetectable except through its interaction with light. It has no impingement on mass in any way. Now, if the ether was still or stationary, then as the Earth went around the sun, all light rays in existence would experience an ether wind. That's what's indicated by my cartoon. The red hash is the ether that, by being stationary, would create a wind in the direction of Earth's orbit around the sun. For example, if the light was radiated in the direction of Earth's motion, then the light would experience a headwind and be slower. Furthermore, if at any given point on the Earth's surface, the magnitude and direction of the wind would vary with the time of day and the season. In order to measure this wind, you would need some source of light that would send rays in two different directions, preferably orthogonal. If the distance they travel is long enough, then one of the two directions will encounter the ether wind and be slower than the other. You can orient these directions any way you want and keep taking measurements. It shouldn't take long to pick up the wind. It was understood that since the speed of light was roughly 10,000 times faster than the speed of Earth going around the sun, the measurement would need to be cutting-edge technology. Enter Albert Michelson, seen at the top. Michelson was fascinated by light for his entire career. After a long history of hundreds of years of numerous experiments to firmly establish the speed of light, Michelson contributed to the effort in 1879. He measured to be 299,909 kilometers per second. In 1881, he invented the Michelson interferometer. A sketch of that is shown here. A source of light is sent towards a half-silvered mirror, which breaks it into two rays of light going to two mirrors. These mirrors reflect the light, which was then seen by a detector. Because the light has a wavelength, this procedure will put the two rays out of phase, creating an interference pattern in the detector. If you carefully adjust the length of one of the distances to one of the mirrors until the rays meet coherently at the detector, you're ready. You then simply rotate the apparatus until the rays become out of phase again. When they're out of phase, this would mean that there is some ether wind slowing down one of the rays as it pushes back on it. My moving cartoon shows this effect on the Blu-ray. Michelson's first attempt in 1881 was not sensitive enough, and so in 1887, he and Edward Morley made the great improvements and created their famed Michelson-Morley experiment, which you see in the picture. It was also an interferometer, bouncing the light on a much longer baseline with many mirrors. To reduce vibrations and increase sensitivity, it was all set up in a huge block of sandstone suspended in a tub of mercury. In the spring and summer of 1887, the two men labored to find the ether wind. To their great dismay and surprise, they found nothing. All of the runs of their experiment never showed any phase shift. They were forced to conclude that they had had a null result. Specifically, they could not observe the expected wind and published it in the fall of 1887, and this is considered the most famous null result of all time. This didn't settle it, though, because people could not believe that this null result was true. Morley himself did not believe his own results and went on to do numerous experiments of ever-increasing sensitivity. All null results. This lack of ether wind was studied and confirmed by many other experiments up until the 1930s when multiple teams of researchers across the world came to the same conclusion with their own interferometers. The work was considered settled, but so troubling that starting in the 1950s, with the invention of lasers and masers, research happened again on interferometry with even greater accuracy. Dozens of teams across the world used the new technology to try to find the ether until the 1970s. They all failed to find the ether wind. And this put the issue to rest until the 21st century. Starting in 2003, a new resurgence in re-examining this settled science arose due to new theories of quantum gravity, which predict violations of special relativity on measurable scales. These new studies, with the most recent in 2015, showed no ether wind to the greatest accuracy yet,
with no evidence found of any variation of the speed of light in any direction to one part in 10 to the 18th. We are now forced to conclude, even though it's an astonishing and lightly unbelievable result, that the ether does not exist. There is no medium in which light travels. Returning to Shakespeare, all these grand failed efforts to find the medium of light's waves remind us of the last part of Hamlet's famous soliloquy. All these researchers tried to probe the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, which puzzles the will and makes us rather bear those ills we have than fly to others we know not of. The ill that we have is that there is no medium for light's traversal. Over a hundred years of searches by dozens of teams have all failed to find it. But now let's go back to see what happened in the wake of Michelson and Morley's 1887 null result. In 1905, Einstein cut through the difficulty when he published his paper on the electrodynamics of moving bodies. Einstein looked carefully at all electromagnetic interactions and noted how some effects were measured depended only on the relative motion of the objects in question. In so doing, he revived and extended Galilean relativity. Take, for example, a permanent magnet and a conducting metal object. Let's take our magnet and move it past the conducting metal object. Here, the motion of the magnet creates an electric field that induces a current in the conductor. Now, if we instead keep the magnet at rest and move the conductor, the moving conductor will then experience a force called an electromotive force, or EMF, that generates a current, but no electric field was created in the vicinity of the stationary magnet. These two effects were always seen as two different phenomena and treated differently with different equations and different names. But Einstein came along and said that the actual observable effect, the generation of a current, does not depend on which object, either the magnet or the conductor, is in motion, but only on their relative motion. To reiterate, in the case of the moving magnet and the stationary conductor, the movement of the magnet creates an electric field around it, which in turn generates a current of the conductor. On the other hand, in the case of the conductor moving and the stationary magnet, Although no electric field is generated in this case, the movement of the conductor through the magnetic field produces an electromotive force, which again results in a current. Einstein's key insight was that the relative motion between the conductor and the magnet produces the same physical effect, an electric current, in both cases, even though the mechanisms are described in different ways. This was an extension of Galileo's boat on a glassy sea, Galileo only considered the relativity of events happening on the boat and being unable to distinguish the boat's constant speed motion from tests done down in the windowless hold. Einstein basically added the idea that if two ships passed each other, each with their own experiments on board their boats, and one boat had a magnet and the other had a conductor, the bosun below decks watching the conductor would know that he was moving with respect to the other boat that had the magnet if he measured a current through the conductor, but he wouldn't again be able to tell if it were his boat that were moving with respect to the shore, or if he were at anchor and the other boat was sailing by. This elevated Galilean relativity up to a new height. As Einstein wrote in 1905, quote, together with the unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth relatively to the light medium, suggest that the phenomena of electrodynamics as well as of mechanics possess no properties corresponding to the idea of absolute rest. They suggest rather that the same laws of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold good. He called this his first postulate of relativity. All physical laws are valid for all inertial frames, no matter their relative motion. His second postulate is the one that triggers so many Doc Brown wannabes into trying to trick out a DeLorean in their garages in their dilapidated ranch houses deep in the woods. Einstein stated that, Light is always propagated in empty space with a definite velocity c which is independent of the state of motion of the emitting body. He goes on to completely adopt the null results of the Michelson-Morley experiment and all its antecedents. Quote, the introduction of a luminiferous ether will prove to be superfluous as the view here to be developed will not require an absolutely stationary space 
provided with special properties, nor sign of velocity vector to a point of the empty space in which the electromagnetic processes take place. This is the core of special relativity. He chose to toss out Newton's concepts of absolute space and absolute time. He chose to throw out your common sense. Making this statement is nothing short of revolutionary. Let's look at some implications for these two postulates. For the first postulate, the laws of physics are the same for all uniformly moving observers, no matter what the speed of the observer is going. Here, uniformly always means with a constant velocity. That is, no acceleration, no turning, no speeding up or slowing down. No such thing as absolute rest, which means that there is no such thing as absolute speed, only relative speed. Any uniformly moving observer can also consider themselves at rest. Every observer also only sees their own time and space as normal. Every possible physical experiment is the same, no matter what your speed is. And here's what happens with the second postulate, that the speed of light in a vacuum is the same for all observers, regardless of their motion relative to the source of the light. This has a lot of implications. The first is, the speed of light is a universal constant. We cannot send or receive information faster than the speed of light and the speed of light does not add or subtract to or from the relative motion of the observer. This has been experimentally verified in all cases. I'll give you the most important punchline here of all. Because of these strange implications, these postulates have been challenged and tested harder than any theory in the history of science. But the degree to which we now trust them has resulted in the odd fact that we no longer measure the speed of light. We define it. In 1983, the International Bureau for Weights and Measures, the international organization responsible for preserving and promulgating scientific measuring standards, held their quadrennial general conference. Prior to 1983, the concepts of space and time were separate. The meter was defined for a long time by the distance between two ticks on a platinum meridian bar at the Bureau in Sevres, France. In 1960, the meter was subsequently redefined to be a large number of wavelengths of light from an atomic transition in Krypton-86. As for time, the second had been defined as the duration of a gargantuan number of vibrations found in an atomic hyperfine ground state transition of cesium-133. The attendees of the 1983 conference then chose to elevate Einstein's postulate to the level of settled science by defining the speed of light to be exactly 299,792,458 meters per second. This definition then removed the need for the standard meter bar, and now it stands as a museum backup piece. Henceforth, the speed of light was then to be recognized and understood as a fundamental universal constant. Interestingly, this basically turned it into a simple conversion factor between space and time, which were now seen to be aspects of, of the same entity, space-time. Einstein's postulates have withstood withering experimental challenges because his assertion that there is no medium for light waves properties combined with the erasure of absolute space and time caused legitimate scientific consternation. Let's now look at the underpinning mathematics that Einstein used to describe his special theory of relativity. After Michelson and Morley revealed their failed attempt to find the ether wind, many physicists, including Voldemar Voigt, George Fitzgerald, Joseph Larmer, and Hendrik Lorentz, were all researching what Maxwell's equations meant and how to accommodate the staggering null result. They all hunted for the transformation between two reference frames where Maxwell's equations were invariant, that is, where you didn't have to modify the form of the equations for any relative motions. They found what was called the Lorentz transformation, shown here, but their combined goal was to preserve the ether's existence. Einstein did his own derivation of the Lorentz transformation for his 1905 paper, starting from his two postulates and arriving at the same set of equations you see here all without relying on an underlying assumption of the ether or even trying to preserve it. Before we follow his derivation, we need to basically understand what the Lorentz transformation is. First, let's go back to the definition of a relatively moving reference frame. Basically, you can think of them as a coordinate grid that's at rest with respect to a given observer. 
each observer can think of their reference frame as a massive cubic grid of meter sticks, and at each intersection in the grid, a clock is fixed to the node. All the clocks in one observer's frame are set up to be in sync, and now, moving relative to that frame, another observer's frame has the exact same arrangement, but centered around him. These two frames are moving uniformly, that is, with a constant speed and no changes in direction or acceleration, with respect to each other. We'll have to pretend that the two frames are made of some ghostly material that allows each other's frames to pass through with them. That's what the diagram on the top left actually means. So, one frame, we'll call it the primed frame, is moving along the unprimed frame's x-axis at a constant speed v. Relatively, the unprimed frame sees the prime frame moving to the right, and the prime sees unprime moving to the left. Our job is now to ask, given this setup and that we live in unprime, how do our measurements in unprime transform over to primes measurements? First, we look at the two equations in the green box at the top. Let's say our two events are the turning on of a light bulb and the detector receiving the light. In our home, unprimed frame, the distance the light travels is delta L squared. And that distance is, of course, just like the Pythagorean theorem, except for each coordinate, we have two locations in each dimension one for the starting place of the light, and the other for the detector. Naturally, that distance is equal to the square of the speed of light times the difference in time between emission and reception. This will have also be true in prime land. Now, Einstein's postulate is that all observers see the same speed of light. So, C is the same for both equations. We don't put any requirements on any other measurements to be the same, however. Indeed, they can't all be the same. The frames are moving with respect to each other. Both of them lead to that intermediate equation with the delta x squared, delta y squared, delta z squared, minus c squared, delta t squared equals zero. They're all of the same form. We'll call that thing here equal to zero. That's in between the green and blue box the space-time interval. We usually denote that interval as delta S squared, as you see below. In our little example with the light bulbs, we see that the events connected by the speed of light are called null space-time intervals because they equal zero. Now, if we do a pair of events that are not connected by the speed of light, like the popping of a cork in unprime and the cork subsequent hitting the wall, what does the frame grid of meter sticks and clocks read in the relatively moving prime frame for these two events? Well, in the blue box, we have two different space-time intervals, each measured in their own frame. In the light bulb example, the space-time intervals were the same and equal to zero. Since this isn't a murder mystery, I'll say up front that the Lorentz transformation requires that these intervals are always the same for the same events measured in two different frames. This means delta S squared is the same as delta S prime squared for all frames. I'll justify and prove this later, but for now, let's take it as a necessary thing that the space-time intervals are invariant. Let's take a look. On the bottom left are Galileo's transformations. These transformations don't on the surface appear to be a good transformation given the co-mingling of space and time, but they seem to work in everyday life, so they can't be 100% wrong. But if you look at events, where you're transforming between two frames at a speed that's an appreciable fraction of the speed of light, then you need the middle set of equations. These are the Lorentz transformations. With this, we now get some odd things. For the x coordinate, which is the direction of motion, x prime does not just depend upon the speed of the relative motion and the event's subsequent position in unprime, but it also now depends on the time measurement in unprime. That's wacky. Even wackier, the time is no longer universally the same. T prime does not equal T unprime. Transforming unprime time to prime time depends not just on their relative motion, but also on the unprime x position. Again, transforming to a time coordinate in prime in the prime coordinate system depends both on the unprime time and the position in unprime. Time and space are interlinked. It means they're really one and the same thing-ish. They're both parts of some broader thing called space-time. 
And that gamma, that's what's called the Lorentz factor, and it's a needed coefficient to the transformation equations. It's an interesting thing, because starting with v being the relative speed between the two frames and c being the speed of light, if v is really small with respect to the speed of light, then the Lorentz transformations are very well approximated by the Galilean transformations. But we also see that as v approaches c, gamma approaches infinity faster and faster. This has strange implications, as we'll see later. Just to reiterate, we got the Lorentz transformations because we assumed two things, Einstein's second postulate and the invariance of the space-time interval. Again, what motivates that second one? The space-time interval is now the thing that is measured in a given inertial reference frame. All the laws of physics and mechanics are the same, which would include the nature of the measurements of distance and time. So the space-time interval invariance is like saying clocks work the same in both frames and meter sticks are the same things and do the same thing in both frames. This Lorentz transformation is central to special relativity. And notice it doesn't ask us to show an absolute space or time. It only shows us how to go between two moving frames, whether very fast or very slow. And the nature of these moving frames coordinates show that each frame measures their own time and their own distance, and each is at rest in their own frame, and each looks exactly as you would expect them to look. It's just like if you were in some room with clocks and meter sticks doing an assignment for a physics class. The same would be true of the moving frame. But when you're chatting with each other about the events you both measure in different frames, you get different results. Okay, now let's see where this transformation comes from. Let's quickly derive the Lorentz transformation. We'll just use Einstein's postulates and some mathematical definitions that don't have any physics attached to them to do it. First, we're going to use the null space-time interval and try to relate the prime to the unprime system. That's the ct squared minus x squared across the top. Again, we assume that we're watching something at rest in prime frame and it's moving by on the x-axis at speed v. So now let's go to the green box. Inside the green box, we have the definition of the hyperbolic sine, cosine, and tangent. Well, strictly, this is not just the, def the full definition. This is just the identities based off of these mathematical curiosities. High school students the world over pour over these in problem sets given to them by teachers bent on getting kids into engineering programs. The cosh, cinch, tanch in their functional forms are lightly nasty looking exponentials, which you can Google or look up in a standard textbook with ease. Anyway, it's important for the space on the slide that I just simply define big C and big S. All right, now in the blue box, we construct by just playing around with the substitutions for a while and get this general solution. So where did this come from? Well, we didn't start with big S and big C where they are. We used dummy letters instead and plugged them back into the top unboxed equation. So after much simplification, the dummy letters are identified with big S and big C because of the identities that you see here. As an exercise, just plug them into the top equation and do the algebra using the identities in the green box. and You'll see how it works out. Now we add two facts about the setup. First, we are at rest at the origin in unprime. So x equals zero always. Next, we see this fact or observe this fact from prime world's perspective to be us falling backwards at a speed v across t prime. That's the measurement of me sitting in one place as seen from prime world's perspective. We take those two facts and plug them back into the blue equations to get the ones in the gray box along the bottom, which is x prime equals ct big S and ct prime equals ct big C. All right, now I'll cross back over to the top. The purple box is what we get if we take those last two equations on the bottom and we divide x prime by ct prime. Obviously, that's just v minus c, but cinch over cosh gives tanch. That opens up some doors. We now know that big C is identically our gamma factor, and big S is now that gamma factor times minus V over C. Pushing that back into the equations in the blue box, we get the red box equations. Comparing them to our original definition of the Lorentz transformation, we see that they are the same. In sum, we took the identity of two null spacetime intervals as seen in two relatively moving frames, 
and ask what prime sees as I sit in place in unprime. Now that's all well and good for null spacetimes, but if we're not talking about light, we necessarily have non-zero spacetime intervals. How do we know that the spacetime interval is invariant? We can again start with two spacetime intervals measured in two different frames. Let's assume that ds squared unprime is equal to some function of space, time, and speed times ds squared prime. That's the most general case. There's only a few ways this function can work. Again, it can be a function of position, orientation, or speed, and its orientation. To start with, let's ask some questions about space and time. Does space itself vary from place to place in any given inertial frame? Are space distances lumpier here and smoother there? It seems like an odd thing to ask or even to state. So let's say that space itself doesn't vary from here to there, no matter your inertial frame of reference. That's nice because you might not want into a wormhole or a toroidal spacetime or multiply connected spacetime with holes like Swiss cheese. And this means we'll assume that space is homogeneous. Therefore, our putative function cannot be a function of position, and it doesn't matter where you set up your inertial reference frames in space. Every spot is just the same as all the other spots. Next, what about the orientation of our reference frame in space? This too sounds odd. Why would it matter which way we chose the x-axis to be? Therefore, we can assume that space and its distances are also isotropic. We wouldn't get different meter stick measurements if we pointed it up versus pointing it to the left, so our function can't depend on the orientation of the relative motion either. We can whiz by anyone from any angle and still get the expected Lorentz transformations. This leaves our little function with only a function of the relative speeds of the two inertial reference frames. To see why this doesn't matter, let's create two more reference frames. We well, have two, why not four? Now, each of these is moving at a constant speed, but all of them are oriented differently from each other. Well, now we're in unprime, and to go from k1 to us, we need a to be a function of v1 only, k1's relative speed to us. k2's a only depends on its relative speed to us as well, v2. Now, if we go then from k2 back to k1, that must only also depend on their relative speed, v12. All right, now we have two ratios that must be equal, because if you equate the first two equations, you get our home ds squared, you get av2 over av1, which is now must be the same as av of 1, 2. Looking at the left side, the ratio of av1 over av2 only depends on their individual speeds with respect to my unprime frame, so there is no directional component. It's just a comparison of speeds. But on the right, av12 will always depend on the orientation of k2's movement compared to k1's movement. That right-hand side can vary between zero and, say, the sum of their relative speeds, but the left is a constant ratio. The only way for them to be equal, which they must be, is for the helper function, a, to be exactly 1. Therefore, the space-time interval is invariant. Not the passage of time, not the physical size or distance in one frame, but the peculiar combination of space and time that shows up in the intervals across the top. And this is what we mean when we say that space and time are intermingled and must be thought of as a unified object called space-time. We will, for all cosmology, apply the idea that the space-time interval is invariant measure of distance, no matter your frame of reference. Now, the previous slide was all dependent upon our assumption of the Copernican or the cosmological principle, that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. This principle has enormous evidentiary support from lots of astronomical observations. If you'd like to learn more about that, go back and watch the chapters 1 and 2 of this series. Also, if you want to learn more about special relativity, watch my series in my introductory astronomy modules on general relativity. I go into some great detail there. Even though special relativity is incredibly important, we're going to say goodbye to it as we go into general relativity and cosmology. But special relativity has some amazing things that we just want to touch on here. Observers in mutually moving reference frames will see each other's clocks running slowly.
They would also see each other's clocks set up in the frame's grid to be out of sync. Of course, each observer would of course see their own clocks running just fine and completely in sync. And because of that, something that's simultaneous in one frame will not be observed to be so from the other frame. This is the source of the barn door and relativistic pole paradox. Further, they don't even measure the same lengths of objects. Each sees each other's objects foreshortened at the direction of motion. But the observers themselves always see their own frame as just fine and not squished flat. To take one example, time dilation itself it can actually be pretty easily studied and understood. Muons are created in the Earth's upper atmosphere when cosmic rays strike atoms at relativistic speeds. These muons have a very short lifespan, so short that they're literally not going fast enough, from a classical perspective, to make it to the ground before they decay. But they are seen to make it to the ground. How is it possible? We see the muon traveling very fast compared to our frame of reference, so we observe its clock slowing down. Well, that's all well and good, but that effect is symmetric. The muon sees our clock slow down too. That sounds bad because now it sounds like it's going to take even more time. But the situation is saved because of the special relativistic length contraction. The Earth's atmosphere and the mountains all look flatter to the muon. The height is foreshortened. So to the muon, the distance is very short. So short that there's more than enough time to get to the ground. And the crazy thing is, this has been measured. And if you add in mechanics and moving masses, you get Einstein's famous equals mt squared equation. And we also learn that massless particles move only at the speed of light. They can't not. This also means that all particles of any kind cannot go faster than the speed of light. And if you want to learn about temporal paradoxes due to special relativity, see my video on tachyons and tacos. Well, that was quite a journey. I'm glad you stuck with me for this hour on special relativity. We covered quite a lot of material, but it's just worth repeating the core tenets of Einstein's work. Special relativity arose out of the crisis between three pillars of classical physics, Galileo's relativity, Newtonian mechanics with absolute space and time, and Maxwell's equations that demonstrated all electromagnetic effects travel at the speed of light. This led to the serious search for the luminiferous ether, the medium in which light travels, which was then met with abject failure. To account for this, Einstein threw out absolute space and time and raised the speed of light to a fundamental universal constant that acted merely as a conversion factor between space and time, or possibly not considered a speed, but rather how space and time combine to become space-time. With that, questions like, how far is a nanosecond? What's the span of time between two sides of a river are actually sensible? Finally, in four-dimensional space-time, we measure true distances using the invariant space-time interval. Well, now this isn't the end of relativity. Next time, we'll see how Einstein's ideas play out in the presence of gravity and how he reconfigured the entire concept of gravity into geometry. If you like this video, please like it, please share it, and please subscribe. Also, consider becoming a Patreon member or becoming a YouTube subscriber. That support goes a long way to help me make these videos. See you next time.